my pleasure to serve as a convener for the second panel on next practical steps to accelerate and broaden the use of machine learning in the geosciences. Um, you know, we're trying to discuss the opportunities and challenges a little bit more um, and sort of touch upon some of the issues we already brought up in the first panel, in particular, what What's the science, right? How can we use machine learning sort of in tandem with physical model to physical modeling to get to the core of sort of Earth system behavior that we'd like to understand? We have one presentation and then time for discussion. And our first and only presentation in this panel is by Kinke Kong of the University of California at Berkeley, and he's uh, going to be presenting remotely. I understand he's online, and he's going to be talking to us about machine learning and seismology, turning data into insights. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Ching Kai. <laughs> OK, good to know. Sorry, yeah, I can't be there uh, in person. I think this is a great workshop that uh, generates a lot of discussions. So I wish I could be there, but uh, due to the babysitting responsibility, so I have to stay. And anyway, so I'm Jing Kai Kong. I'm an assistant researcher here at Berkeley Seismology Lab. So today I'm going to talk about like machine learning in seismology, like turning data into insights. So this is actually a talk, like actually based on the uh, paper we actually uh, published last year. So this is actually a uh, collective intelligence like uh, efforts that uh, all these different uh, authors actually contributed a lot into this paper that we try to answer the question what's the stats of the machine learning um, in seismology and uh, how we actually can like generate uh, like motivations to turn your data into insights so this is actually me and also Daniel Trockman and also uh, Zach Ross and uh, Michael uh, Bianco and uh, Brandon Meads and uh, Peter Gerstoff uh, that we worked together. And uh, Peter is the leading actually effort that put together this whole team to work on, the, on this paper. So in this paper, we actually reviewed like a different type of uh, learning, like uh, Karen already covered this. I won't go into the details about this, but uh, like a lot of the learning, machine learning problems fall into this supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And also a lot of that uh, recently, uh, like we see a lot of improvement or like uh, advances in the supervised learning because there's an actual bit of information, the labels, that can give the machine learning more, more chances to learn the problem right and so on. So um, in this paper, we also covered different areas um, instead of based on different uh, uh, methods. So you can read the paper like in the agenda, like after the agenda in the, in the, in the, uh, in the booklet that is sending out last week. So you can see that we, co we covered a lot of earthquake detections. And also this morning, Zach gave a really nice presentation how to use like a deep learning to do the earthquake detection. And also we covered uh, machine learning applications in earthquake warning. So that's also like we use the smartphone data to do earthquake warning and also like other type of machine learning, uh, machine learning applications in this field. For example, Man Andrin's work from Caltech that to distinguish uh, uh, noise from the real signal and so on. And also like we have the covered machine learning in the ground motion prediction, how we actually training the model to do a better job of predict the ground motions. And also, of course, like a tomography is a big area in, in seismology as well. So there's a lot of like applications or like uh, uh, efforts in this area as well. Um, last in the paper, but not least, is the earthquake geodesy and other applications. So if you read that, you can see like in our field, people are really trying to apply different type of machine learning algorithms or other type of algorithms that's related to applying that on the data to our field, which are really interesting. So um, since we had a lot of discussion this morning on specific applications, so I won't go to the details about like this review paper. You can read this review paper offline and also like try to read some of the papers we listed there. But in this 
this, um, in this section, we have these three different questions. So which I want to cover these three different questions, but you, um, based on some of my thoughts, it may be not uh, right because some of them may be like just a premature, but I just want to lay in laying out here so that uh, we can generate more discussions in the in the panel discussion so today i'm going to talk so first some limitations of the current machine learning algorithms i know that uh, everyone is like really uh, into the machine learning these days but i think understanding some of the limitations of the current machine learning algorithm actually gives us like a, um, a way to basically to um, examine the machine learning algorithm and also think about how that applied to, to geosciences and how to make improvement on that. So I treat this from a, like an optimistic like, uh, perspective. So then I will show some of the examples that uh, the existing efforts combining machine learning with the physics model because we, the, the, the topic or the the theme of this workshop is basically how we can actually use machine learning to uh, beyond the black box, right? Like we want to, as a scientist, we want to combine machine learning with the great power of the, like the traditional physic, physic modeling and so on. And also uh, I will finish it, like uh, conclude it with the uh, moving forward. But I think Karen already covered most part of it. I will just uh, add in some of the parts uh, in the last section. So let's start with some of the limitations on the current machine learning algorithm. Like I mentioned that um, this is not saying like uh, uh, machine learning has a lot of limitations. Uh, we, won't, we won't use it. Actually, it's in the in, 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 in opposite that uh, like machine learning has a lot of great power that we sh already sh uh, saw that uh, like a lot of applications this morning, but also these limitations that we need to use it more carefully. And also we need to understand that like uh, machine learning are not magic. Like a lot of people in our field, actually I talked with some of the, the, uh, the folks at various places. Some of them are thinking machine learning kind of like our magic that we can cover all the problems in our field and to solve all the existing problems. But this is actually not true. So if you think machine learning, it's really good at like a pattern recognition. It's just a small part of all the, all the scientific problems we want to solve. So that's why I just want to set the stage that saying machine learning is not magic. And once you learn the skills and the two sets, it's just a, like a two sets into our like geophysicists or geoscientists like a toolbox that we can solve more difficult questions that can't be easily used mathematical model or can't easily be, be modeled and so on. So one thing is that when you look at machine learning, usually I think machine learning algorithms are narrow applications, which means that when we train a model, we use a specific data and we, we target very specific problems. And we can get a really nice performance, like it's showing here is just a sketch of what I was thinking of machine learning versus other general purpose algorithms. There's algorithms that works on various type of uh, problems, but the performance may be just like around the average, like that dotted line showing maybe the average performance. But like machine learning, once you train with large amount of data sets for one specific problem, so it can, it can have a very nice performance, but, but this performance also have some sacrifice as well, which means that these machine learning algorithms usually are narrow, very narrow applications that if you want to apply to some other area or some other data sets, you may just need to retrain or like uh, it's just not working uh, exactly as we thought, like it can be working uh, uh, on wide range of problems. And also another limitation, I think it's already covered by other like uh, speakers this morning is that we need a lot of this structured data. 
So when we do machine learning, we found out that most of the time we need to cut our data into like this matrix and we need to make sure all the data is like uh, uh, well organized into the format that generate uh, uh, put into the machine learning algorithms. And we need lots of them, especially when deep learning becomes popular. And then it just starts to, it's a really um, data greedy algorithm that we need a lot of data to train the gigantic model uh, well. And also we need lots of good data as well. Like uh, if we have bad data, we usually, your output will be bad as well. It, it, machine learning has some capability of generalize the problem, but it's just like a weak generalization instead of like a strong generalization. I will talk a little bit more uh, about that later, but also like a, a lot of the advances in the supervised learning that we need really good label data. And this is not true in a lot of our fields that some, some of the fields that due to the constraint of the time scale or due to the constraint of rare ev events that we only have small data sites or we only have like a very rare limited uh, labeled data. So how we actually use machine learning in the limited data approach, that's also a hot research topic that in computer science, if you look at like a few short learning and also some other type of learning algorithms, try to like teach the machine learning algorithms um, using like a small data sets. But also sometimes I was thinking that if their data set is relatively small and can be, can be like approached or addressed using the traditional approach, that's actually maybe a place that we, we definitely like uh, uh, should just try the traditional approach first instead of like relying everything uh, on machine learning. Just to give one, this is like one thought experiment, for example, um, it maybe needs a couple of apples to drop on the Newton's uh, hat to basically have the, the this like a, um, this this Newton's law uh, come out. But how much data do we really need from machine learning perspective? That how many apples do we need to observe, or how many other like data uh, we need to collect to train a machine learning algorithm to recognize or to, to understand this law or to basically condense this law into this equation. I think this is still very hard problems that people are starting to attacking these, these, these limitations, but still there's a long way to go. So I will cover that in more details in the uh, second part, like the physics model uh, parts. And also, um, in our field, we always have a very famous saying, garbage in, garbage out. I think that still applies that uh, um, when we have garbage data as the training data, usually the results are also very bad. So this is like not saying like, uh, I want to detect, a, detect uh, 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 like uh, some signal, but the signal is completely buried into noise that uh, can you use machine learning to find it? I think that's probably a very hard problem for machine learning as well. Like machine learning is based on patterns. We need to see these patterns from the data that we can generalize. And also um, another limitation is that sometimes there's always bias in the data that uh, it's very hard to identify and also very hard for us. Sometimes we, we, come, we, we, we are easily to uh, like to uh, uh, prone to this, this kind of bias. I use an example from like other fields instead of like from our fields. I can mention a little bit more of our fields as well, but you can see that, so this is a machine learning algorithm trying to recognize whether it's a man or a woman to do what kind of cooking and so on. But the training data science sometimes like you start to have a lot of these pictures that have more females that actually starts to generate these type of errors that uh, uh, the, 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 the algorithm starts to make this uh, prediction based on this bias. <coughs> Sorry, I think because of the heavy smoke here. Yeah, and also in our field as well, like um, I always, most of my research is focused on detection as well. But I think these bias are also there. For example, we have a lot of noise. We have a earthquake signal, we have noise. But this noise data from many different sources. 
some sources are actually not present in the training data, or it's very rare that it may be just a bias that we ignore, the model will ignore some parts of the noise and then just predict the majority. We may, we may have a model that have a very high performance, but it may be make some wrong decisions at very critical uh, situations especially like for real-time applications, like earthquake warning, that if we have some certain type of rare signal just to come up and detect it as a magnitude nine earthquake, it will, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Yeah, it will basically cause uh, panic and so on. And also, we always talk about like machine learning has the capability of generalization that we train on a training data and some of the new data, unseen data will perform equally well or even better and so on. But, but this is actually assumption that machine learning actually have weak generalization, which means that if the data distribution, you can see the left figure here. So basically I plotted the data distribution and the, the, the training, data, the training uh, data distribution is the red curve here. And also the blue one is the new uh, training data or is the new test data or the targets that you want your machine learning to work on. You can see that when the, when the distribution are very similar to each other, that uh, this algorithm actually will work well. Yes, even there's uh, some like uh, discrepancies between these like uh, two different uh, uh, situations, but it may not work well. I think for this strong, uh, strong generalization, which means that my training data distribution is totally different from my, my new distribution. And also there's only slightly like overlap and so on. So this is like the strong generalization uh, case that may not work well. <clears throat> this is also like uh, from uh, Franco's uh, uh, figure I actually get from one of his famous book, uh, deep learning with Python. So you can see that basically, like if these blue dots are the training data we have, we can make some extrapolation or we can make some generalization when we see some new data like uh, nearby the, 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 the data points. So this is basically called like local, uh, local, local generalization or weak generalization. That's current machine learning algorithm has. So in terms of like extreme generalization, it may not work well for most of the applications. For example, if we train, a, train an algorithm to detect like, a, for, for example, earthquake signals on this region, and we move to other region that have completely different type of signal, might not like from the real earthquake or quarry blast and so on, it may not just work like as we expected. So that's why we need to realize these like a generalization purpose, a generalization capability of the machine learning algorithms. And also uh, recently the most famous one uh, technique or like a uh, 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 way to to do this um, like a transfer to do this like a transfer the learning from one data set to another is this transfer learning. So basically like we can train a model on a very large data set and then so you can directly apply to other region or other problem sets, but it may not work well due to like a specific situations at other regions. But then what you can do is that you cut the model, basic, basically just cut a certain part of the model generate the features and then adding in some of the new models on the new data set to retrain it, to fine tuning some of the, the structure so basically you can see these pre-trained trained layers won't change uh, when you apply to a new small data set at uh, some other regions, for example. And uh, only one layer will be like a retrained based uh, to accommodate these new situations. I think this is actually looks really promising in different fields. And also uh, in our fields, there are some people applying this as well. Like uh, this is basically we add in some new layers and then we retrain, we retrain this new layer based on only small data sets to, to assume that these pre-trained layers have already encoded some of the knowledge or some of the, the experiences we have from the previous um, large data sets. So this is actually 
make the generalization capability a little bit stronger, but still I tried, so here we actually tried to, to uh, detect like the damage building from social media data. One of the students working with me on detect that, we tried to use the image net actually to transfer the features. We found out that that only uh, improve a little bit, but if we include a lot of like the, the uh, damage building in the, in the, in the image net, we actually have better results. Still, this is showing the capability that like the generalization um, capability is relying on like the distribution of the training data. And sometimes like it's more critical that we understand that when we apply to the new things, we should have the relatively similar distribution. And also, of course, like I think the main topic today uh, in this workshop is that a lot of people are criticizing machine learning as a black box, that we have input, we have output, happy output, but we don't know what exactly going on inside this box. I think, I think that's one thing is that it's difficult to interpret how it works well after we train the model and we just see that it satisfy our, our task. But also the other thing is that it may not bounded by the existing laws. For example, if we want to uh, predict uh, temperature, temperature within a region and no, no like, a, 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 like a, a region or maybe the temperature also follow some like existing laws that we need to uh, bound it the algorithm. So this is all the missing parts in, in the current machine learning algorithms. So luckily there are a lot of people actually try to tackle this problem um, uh, for, for more uh, advanced uh, techniques. So also there are more limitations. I don't want to uh, like uh, spend more time on that, but I think people maybe just uh, like uh, understand or have a sense of these ones are, it's better for like uh, building future models. For example, machine learning algorithms are actually very, um, are actually very vulnerable. So there's a lot of study already show that like uh, when they train a lot of uh, recognition pictures and so on. So people found that sometimes even you change one pixel it will confuse the deep learning, basically make wrong decisions. So this is a lot of, this is actually uh, more important in real time systems that uh, more on the security side, but uh, this is just a showing case that uh, it's more difficult for us to train a model that, uh, uh, that uh, like uh, uh, arrow free or like arrow proof and so on. So sometimes we need to know this vulnerability and to test this vulnerability in the future. And also it's not easy to learn in real time, even though there's a lot of algorithm trying to learn online algorithms, like you have a batch of new data comes in, you retrain the model, but it's actually very uh, difficult to train a stable model and so on. And also that uh, this link also gives you uh, at this year's AAAS meeting, there's a nice talk about misapplication, misapplying of machine learning actually in science may generate like a, may cause a science crisis. I think it's also worth, uh, worth reading and so on. So I talked about these limitations, but it's not like I mentioned that we, we want as a machine learning practitioner or like applying machine learning in our field, we need to know these limitations and to, to keep that in mind that uh, machine learning is not a general tool that applying for everything. But also there's a lot of examples in combining the physics, trying to answer the question like how we beyond this black box. So I, I put together this one here is that like usually as a domain scientist, we are very familiar with the, like this physics model, numerical modeling uses a small amount of data, but also these machine learning algorithms started to, to like a dominant, uh, like the, the data, data rich field. And also especially deep learning that uh, use a lot of data to automatically find features to make the task uh, finish. And there's a need that we need to some hybrid approach that to combining the powerful, the two domain, uh, two domains that to like uh, advance our science. 
So like I mentioned, there's a lot of researchers are actually working on this. I think I will just give like some starts to generate more discussions, how we actually apply this to uh, different, like uh, to combine the physics and so on. So one thing is that we know that like uh, uh, Karen also mentioned that different models have different interpretability uh, based on how they design the, the algorithm. We can see that so the horizontal axis here is how flexible the model is or how powerful the model is. You can think that way. And the more powerful algorithms, deep neural network, we have less interpretability uh, because like it's so complicated that it's difficult to understand what is going on. But also there are simple algorithms that give us more like insights if we want to interpret the results. So I think one thing is that we shouldn't stop when we training a machine learning task and get a good model. I think that's not the point we stop. I, I think that's actually a, just a start that uh, we want to understand what exactly the model learned and uh, how to interpret the results. There's a lot of uh, applications or like a research on the computer science domain that after they trained the model, so they actually try to visualize the kernels and try to do some statistic analysis on these kernels to understand each kernel and each layer, what it does it learn. So um, for example, in earthquake detection problems, so the kernel we learned in the deep learning algorithms sometimes also give us like insights as well. So one of the uh, exercise we did here, we found that different layers kind of filter the, uh, filter the waveform into different frequency bands. And also some of the layers or kernels try to compress the, the, the noise. Some of them are actually try to amplify the signal and so on. So this type of application are more, I, I think is like a, a, we need more uh, analysis after we're training the good model and to put it into production. And also another one is like using synthetic data. I think Diego gave a very nice presentation how or why we need the synthetic data if we don't have enough observations to tackle some specific problems. Also, there's applications that use this approach to reduce the simulation computation cost. For example, um, this is actually a work by, uh, by uh, Fabi from Harvard and also uh, Brandon uh, Mead's work. So they basically use machine learning to train, to train on the, like, uh, the, the uh, viscoelastic deformation calculation, and then they actually can improve the speed by 50,000%, which actually is a very nice application that when you apply these uh, large scale simulations, if you have a, a machine learning algorithm learned these features and learned how to, how to do these simulations, you can do this much faster uh, in, in, in this sense. And also there's ways to encode the physics laws into the machine learning algorithms. For example, we all know that in machine learning, it's an optimization algorithm that we already have an error of the estimation from the machine learning compared with the observations. And then we try to minimize this error by changing the weights. So uh, Diego and I talked that it's actually a very nice or smart way for grid search of the parameters or uh, like uh, uh, to, to reduce the, the errors. And then we can add in terms that like whether the machine learning estimation is to follow the physics law or not by basically encoding this physics into the, into the machine learning algorithms. So this is actually a link to a paper published last year, basically trying to use this approach to estimate the lake temperature modeling. So you can see this is the different uh, uh, the features generated into or fit into the machine learning algorithms. And also, but machine learning algorithms always like try to estimate the temperature in different uh, range and also like in, in, in like a random way. But these temperatures in the lake actually have follow some laws if we know the density and also if we know the depths, you can see this is actually existing laws. So basically what they did is that they added in this loss function that whether the estimation from the machine learning is 
uh, align with this FedEx law or it's inconsistent with this law. So basically, when we minimize this lost function, this algorithm will also like uh, try to for, uh, try to train the, the machine learning algorithm that to follow this physics law. So this is actually the result you can see using a neural network. So this is a physics physical in, in consistent, you can get like a nice result. So this is actually vertical axis is the arrow from the from the the, the test data set. So you can see using a pure physical approach, you, you don't have the physics, physical inconsistency and your error is relatively high, but use an artificial neural network, so you have a relatively high physical inconsistency, but the error is relatively low. But when you're combining these two, so you actually have a <clears throat> very nice result that lower, lower arrows with like more uh, 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 aligning with the physical, uh, physical like a loss. And also, there's ways that uh, you can respect in the laws of the physics by like encode the nonlinear like a PDE uh, per, uh, partial differential equations into the machine learning algorithm as well. So this is actually, um, I think I may forgot to put the paper link here. I will add the paper link to this one. And let me also see what's the time, uh, just to make sure I have any enough time. So basically, this is the, 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 the uh, Burgers equation that uh, like a, uh, using, using, used a lot in like a fluid, fluid dynamics modeling and so on. So this is actually a way that uh, using the, try to use the machine learning to, to, base, to learn this par, uh, partial differential equation. So you can see that you, we, we have this like a, a different, the 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 like the potential fields u here like to take the derivative respect to like the input x the the position and also the time uh, scale as well so this equation you can actually form a function that uh, to use the machine learning algorithm to capture it so this is uh, actually how we can actually capture it by putting together like a, a this is like a, if we use TensorFlow that we can see that the code basically here showing that this is like we generated the network or the, the weights of the machine learning algorithms uh, to, to mimic or to try to learn the U field, like the potential field basically from the input of X and T. But also we can form another uh, the function basically taking the derivative of the different uh, parameters that we want to we want to like uh, based on the differential equation and then we're adding them together and then put that into a loss function that can basically encode the arrow the, the arrow from the observation and the the the, uh, the the estimation of of the machine learning algorithm and also encoding this differential equation into the machine learning algorithm basically you can see that when we train the algorithm the algorithm itself will take the weights from the machine learning algorithm and take the weights doing the differential, uh, like the derivative uh, respect to different parameters, which actually encoded the physics model uh, into the, uh, the, the physics like uh, uh, governing equation into this training. And also this is basically another way to think about uh, like uh, this is another paper discovering the physics concepts with neural network, which is showing a lot of uh, existing examples that we can use the machine learning to try to understand. For example, this is a sim simple, like a uh, very, uh, very simple, like a damped, uh, uh, like a damped spring system that you have this K, the spring of the, the spring coefficients and also like the, um, the, 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 this B value here basically is the damper and its governing equation basically is this differential equation. And when they train the algorithm for using an artificial neural network, they learned that the, the neurons actually in each after training are actually correlated with these different parameters that you can extract this equation after that. Uh, there's also some other methods that we talked before. I think a lot of in our field, we, we already seen that the Bayesian approach that actually can incorporate a lot of the prior information from physics. 
for example, there's a based in finite force inversion from Sarah Minson's work, and also there's a based in uh, like a based detection, like from Stuart Russell's like a night visa and sink visa, and you can search for the paper basically trying to use the existing prior information. We know the seismicity, we know where the earthquake usually occur, we know the, this type of information for like a constraint the, the model uh, learning. And also like there's another like a approach basically recently tried to combine in Bayesian approach with deep learning, try to give uncertainty, error uncertainties to the kernels that we learned from the automatic like uh, feature extraction. And also the GAM model is also very popular these days, which means that you have two models competing with each other. One model is generating the data points from like a from, from like a certain type of distribution. And the other model is make the decision whether this model is wrong or bad, or like more, more fake or like more uh, trustable and so on. How we can actually add in the uh, physics into the, gener uh, the generator actually can help us to combining the data, uh, uh, com combining the physics into machine learning algorithms. There's a paper about this, I won't go into details, but you can explore more if you want. So I will finish here with some of looking forward to here. I think Carrie Ann did a very nice job in her review paper laying out these different areas. I also just want to highlight or like emphasize the, 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 the some uh, aspects. For example, the benchmark data sets, it's really driven the community, uh, computer science community to make better algorithms and to make this deep learning becomes really, really powerful. So basically they put this image net like this large scale uh, benchmark data set. Every year there's people like try to compare the new algorithms, like how they actually error decay on these data sets so that people actually can, can compare with each other. And also there's a lot of new data sources as well, like Carrie mentioned, but also we need a way to fusion the data together, like a good quality, bad quality, and also like a different type and so on. Sometimes it's hard to use the, it's easy to use individual data, but how you combine them is actually very interesting problem as well. For example, my shake actually, we, I, I worked on use the smartphone data to detect the earthquake, to do earthquake warning. So we actually, uh, launched a new version last, uh, last week. We actually got like a half million downloads last week, which gave us a lot of data that, but how we actually combine this data into, the, into other type of data is another type of uh, like uh, area that we need to work on. Be beyond that, also some of the new things that we never thought of before, maybe like a smart, meet, smart like sensors at home, like in the cars, and also like in the CCTV cameras or drones and so on. All these things are providing new data and new challenges for us, uh, for, the, for the whole community. I think I will stop here and hope that I generate a lot of um, like a heat here to, to encourage more discussion on the limitations on the physics uh, machine learning approach. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chenkai. This is uh, great, and uh, we really very much appreciate you addressing these questions so well. And I think there's lots of uh, a lot of good starts for discussion. Um, I, I have a quick follow-up question myself. While people collect their thoughts, you showed this uh, lake level temperature problem paper, and the machine learning approach with the physics guidance produced the same kind of uh, adherence to the physics at lower levels of misfit and i was just wondering how that's possible because there seems to be like a missing piece in terms of different priors so that the physics only model enforce smoothness when it shouldn't have or is there something like that going on i think yeah that's a f very fair question and good point so also like that uh, that work is not my work and i uh, just uh, like maybe try to summarize that uh my based on my thinking so so what they used for training is that they had a lot of these observations from the lake and lake temperature and different features for example the 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 uh the sun like the sun radiation and also like some other uh features so 
if you use physics as like a to to model this, so you actually captured the general, you you basically captured the general uh, match of the data. There's a lot of like there's these small scale uh, variations. I think it why it works really well is that the machine learning actually helps to try to capture some of these small variations not that's not captured by the physics, but also with this constraint of physics that in the cost of function, it's actually make the make the 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 training more reliable even you use relatively smaller data sets instead of like you need a lot of these data sets or like much longer observations to make the correct decision so that's why what i think is that like combining these two actually are powerful thank you all right let's follow up with questions to ching kai first oh thank you ching kai um I guess I have a question that clearly we cannot do everything in machine learning. Otherwise, you have to buy a lot of computers and generate a lot of green, green, um, greenhouse gas. So uh, is there a simple guideline for geologists that what kind of applications we should definitely go for machine learning? And is there any kind of a, um, example that we probably don't need that kind of tool? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. To be honest, uh, I don't have that list. Uh, what kind? Of, so I already only think in my field, like in my in my uh, domain um, in the past. But I think I think Karen's review paper also, like in our review paper in the seismological uh, research letters, I also mentioned that like what kind of problems that you already tackled using machine learning, and also these ones like uh, most of the problems that uh, go to at like if the problem has like a certain pattern that's uh, hard to capture by equations or hard to capture by like intuitive like. Uh, uh, algorithms, so it's probably like a, a very good fit for machine learning algorithms. But uh, but if you look at most of the applications right now, we are doing is still within like a automate a lot of these tedious time tedious work. I think that's really important to, as a first step that we try to automate a lot of this. But then later parts, it's more useful to the to the sciences that how you use the new automated system to generate more insights from uh, like the science domain. For example, that's work like finding a lot of these new smaller events that uh, what that tells us and so on. Okay, other questions? Otherwise, we will open it up to you know all speakers of, of this morning. So I have a question to Chinkai and also probably Zach and maybe others as well. And I, you, you discussed the, um, the transfer learning. And I, I guess one of the challenges that we have in terms of understanding process has to do with coupled problems. And we you know, briefly talked about the landslide or cascading hazards as well. But if you, if you turn to it, you know, just take a simple or simple complicated example like a volcanic arc above a subducting slab and want to build a database. Um, it's like an earthquake catalog. And you have two very distinct processes, shallow and deep, and in the, in the same data set. Is, is, is a, um, is, we traditionally separate one or the other and, and analyze the group separately as well. But are, are, is there a potential then with the transfer learning to actually make some um, progress at coupled complex processes like fluid transfer from one from the ongoing slab to the overriding plate in time and space um, or, or are we a ways away from these kinds of uh, problems I don't know how far you've experimented with with more complicated data sets and taking learning from one to another uh, maybe, that, yeah yeah, maybe well, you, you yeah go ahead yeah, maybe I answer first. So um, uh, Zach can add in later. So basically, 
my experience with the transfer learning is that usually you have like a large data sets, like you have the problem very well defined, then you train the algorithm. The algorithm will capture the different features for these data sets. And then these features, there's some general features, there's some more specific features. So the specific features is more tied to this one specific uh, problem or task. And the general features may apply to different uh, like uh, problems. So that's why I think the, the transfer learning in this sense actually works that when you have another problem, for example, like the, you, the, the two problems you mentioned, there's like a similarities between each other, but there's also difference between each other. So if you use one, like uh, one problem to design the to extract the general features and use the general features to applying to the other one that uh, similar processes but uh, then more specific features that will be learned by the new layers you added it actually can can success or like can improve the the results but it's not work always like uh, i saw like there's like like a different type of applications like there's like for example in image processing there's like you you learn from one type of dog or drag uh, or cats like you train them algorithm on that but then you're applying on detecting cars it's still working the reason is that like uh, some of these features is just uh, like uh, try to find the boundary of the object and then this find find the boundary of the object in cars is also useful like you find the boundary of the cars and then you make the decision so that's why like this transfer learning usually in my opinion it's is like more useful when you have like uh, some similar features and uh, um, that uh, similar in certain degree. I, I guess to briefly just follow up on this, it, it seems like if you're trying to do things like solid fluid in the actions or multi hazards, as Cindy said, then we already know that at certain spatial temporal scales, some of those interactions will matter, and then others they won't. So it seems like, again, this is like a real tough and tall order for machine learning system to give a general answer because we already know it's not going to work for certain spatial temporal scales. And this sort of brings me to a question I asked Karian when she visited UTIC a few weeks back. I guess, do you get good information about the misfit and the reliability of the extrapolation out of these, out of these algorithms? Could you at least use them to say, oh, stop here, don't trust that anymore? All right. <laughs> I, I, I got a note here. Zach wants to follow up. Yeah. Maybe on the earlier one. <laughs> um, getting kind of confidence estimates is, is a hard problem. Um, it's, it's something that's actively being pursued by the computer scientists. Um, to some degree, it depends on um, whether you can you can learn a distribution of the data and um, so there's there's some potential from kind of what would be called generative models which is basically yeah it, you're learning a distribution rather than, or the parameters of a distribution rather than um, discriminative modeling which is kind of more functional based um, and so because of that is a distribution you can kind of sample the space and, and kind of quantify where you are um, but it's it, this is still not an easy easy thing to do. Yeah. I would just uh, emphasize with Zach, I think this is a very active area of research in the machine learning community. So it's something where people are proposing solutions for that kind of problem. But I think it's still something that um, you know hasn't really fully been been solved. But when you, you usually when you apply a neural network, you get sort of a point estimate out, and so that's what you get. And if you want to get more than that, um, it's going to take sort of new, new techniques and, and methods. And, and so that is an active area, but I think right now it is hard to get a measure of the uncertainty. So um, this reminds me actually of a question I wanted to ask Zach earlier and I didn't really get a chance. So one of your comments, Zach, was um, when you were tra you know, training the algorithm to detect P waves and S waves, that this was, it comes to this sort of 
you know, transferability of the learning question. And you were making the comment that it was um, relatively straightforward to transfer the learning from detecting P waves and S waves in one region to another region. And you made the comment that this was, you could do this better, or I forget exactly how you phrased it, but that this was easier to do than using the traditional methods. I mean, you know, the standard um, seismic phase detection kind of approaches um, that we've been using for decades. And I, I wonder, can you amplify what you meant by that a little bit? Because obviously we can deploy a seismic network Work and use you know standard triggering type algorithms to detect seismic waves and locate earthquakes, and then we could apply the kinds of approaches you were talking about this morning. So can you explain a little more where the advantages are of using these new approaches over the older ones? Yeah. Uh, um, well, so just to be clear, when when we're talking about transfer learning, it's a very specific thing. So there's transfer learning and then there's generalization, and transfer learning specifically basically means taking a model that has already been trained on some data set, right? Um, and so that model is the parameters have been filled out, they've been learned. Um, now you're going to kind of keep part of that model. You're going to retrain the rest of it and you're going to basically fine tune what you trained before to a different data set. So that, that specifically is transfer learning. So the idea is that um, the, the original model can be trained out in full to learn kind of course structure in the data. Um, and that's because you have lots of data that might be from a model, for example, the simulations, um, and that we expect the simulations at a very coarse scale to look very similar to um, the real conditions that you're interested in. But then kind of the, the more nuanced structure of the data that might be you know, noise dependent or, or things like that, that's where the transferring learn tra the transfer learning is done because you're fine tuning that now um, to this. So just to be clear, generalization is different where you take the model as is and you apply it to a completely different domain. Um, so yes, we see um, pretty in, in this regard we see significant generalization capabilities. Um, it's not perfect, and there's still lots of stuff we don't understand at all. Um, but but I've been able to take you know these models that are trained entirely on data from um, Southern California, shall, relatively shallow seismicity, there's obviously no subduction events there. Um, it's, it, it's able to still kind of generalize to other tectonic regimes. And the reason is because I think very simply, it's that you're looking at kind of what's common to all of these P waves and what's common to all these S waves. And so is there some kind of relatively crude characteristics of them, which we know is the, the particle motion and things like that, um, that is generalizable. Um, a big part of the neural net where, where they stop working is, is they tend to be very fragile to kind of, you know, to weird um, conditions that are, that are changing as well. And, and that's part of this kind of, I mean, we talked about it a little bit today, but this concept of adversarial examples where if you add kind of epsilon white noise to an image or something, then you can kind of push the, the decision completely over the boundary to the other side and, and you can kind of interpret things with high confidence. Um, we're seeing some of that for sure, but it's not exactly clear where those things. Yeah. So if I can push just a little more, but I still don't understand the difference. So, you know, traditional de network detection kind of approaches of STA, LTA, and yeah. things, algorithms, association algorithms like binder and things like that. Obviously, you can go and apply those to any other region as well. Yeah. So, so what is it specifically that the, the machine learning algorithms I mean, so the machine learning algorithms, obviously the, the Southern California example, you're essentially extending the detection capability down by one, one magnitude unit. And so you would expect a similar sort of uh, effect in some other region. But I, I, was, I was just trying to understand if there was something else that these algorithms are bringing that you weren't getting when you transfer these more traditional sort of, you know, association algorithms to other regions. Um, okay, so basically from my perspective, um, if you were to just take an arbitrary data set, you don't know anything about it, you don't even know if there's earthquakes in it or not, um, trying to, so there's a, there's a couple aspects about this. The computational infrastructure you need in terms of the software is like these giant stacks of stuff, right? libraries, manuals, reading through all this, learning how to do this. You have to become an expert in how to run these, these software platforms. You have to then know how to tune the parameters of it such that the results of the catalog are, are appropriate and things like that. And that's totally a non-trivial exercise. This is for the traditional yeah, with the standard stuff, STA, LTA, binder, all this kind of stuff. Um, what's the advantage of the machine learning is that in theory, you could have kind of more end-to-end -end solutions um, that you encode kind of simple rules in there, like our associators just 
giving it examples of, of associated um, events, right? And it's learning to do that, right? And that's, once you, do, it's, it's like this much code to do that once I generate the training data set. And so um, it's not a very complicated exercise to learn how to run all this stuff. And there's very few sensitive parameters because the system is kind of self-optimized to get the best performance. So that's my take on it. One, one quick question, which is a follow-up to that. Have you, have you tried applying this to, well, there's not that many earthquakes in Cascadia, but there are some where you get deeper earthquakes. Have you tried it with completely, where you don't just have shallow events? Uh, I, I'm thinking in particular the associator, the, that, that would be presumably where, where there would be more difference. Um, so I haven't talked about it, but our associator is actually trained entirely with synthetic data. Um, so we generate the training data entirely from a model. Yep. We take it. It basically learns to recognize wave fronts from this synthetically generated data, and right. we directly apply it in situ to um, to the real data, and it works. Well, what I was well. thinking is that the wave front, the way the wave front goes through the network from a slab event, will look different than a shallow crustal event. Sure. Um, so that would be the question: is how much do you have to retrain, or could, or, well, or, or, or it might actually be getting principles that would apply to both. I, so we train it separately for every reason that we would apply it to. Okay. But that's a one-time thing you have to do. It's it's only you know it's like a few hours of time to, to get it there. And obviously we don't acquire data that at that phase. Yeah. Okay. And then one other quick question on this sort of transfer problem, which is a little bit more general. Um, uh, Ching Kai mentioned. Uh, uh, transfer some layers and retrain some other layers. How do you decide which layers to transfer and which layers to retrain? Is that a trial and error process or is there something that actually comes out of the algorithm that you get some sense of where within these multiple layers is it actually extracting information? Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that, that's actually a very good question for, for the deep learning approach. Like when you train on a specific problem, you're the, the first few layers are general like uh, features. And when you go deeper and deeper layers, it becomes like more specific features. For example, uh, use the cat and dog example, like uh, for the first few layers, maybe just uh, like the boundary edge detection of the, the cats and dog. And then for the, the, the later layers, the deeper layers, maybe just like the eye, like a ear or color, like more, more specific features to different type of uh, uh, objects. So that's why like usually when you do this transfer learning, you want to use the general uh, features that uh, similar to each other that you just uh, cut like the first few layers and then transfer it to the to another problem and adding in layer adding in new layers basically in the deeper layer to learn these like more specific ones and then that will basically capture like more specific or more task or new object oriented features. Um, can I ask another follow-up question? So I remember recently I read this article, maybe in Science or Nature, about uh, autopilot. They were not able to recognize a stop sign because there's a sticker on the stop sign, so they just read it as speed limit 45 miles per hour. So I guess my question is, so for those, you train your seismic data, and could that be always some kind of new condition that came out like clock air or just something in your data set that you you were not expecting that and then because of that new condition and then you just totally misidentify something and because you are generating millions of detection and you actually you actually have you have very limited chance to actually find that afterwards um yeah oh. okay oh. okay um yeah, I think this gets back to what I was just talking about, about these adversarial examples. So this is kind of exposing this fragility of neural networks that, that's very well known at this point. Um, and so um, to some degree, I, originally this started out about five years ago where people recognized this flaw in these systems and then um, it led to kind of this interaction back and forth where people then came up with a way to avoid it and then people broke it again. Some hacker basically figured out how to exploit this again. And, and to, it looks like there are even theoretical arguments for why that you would never be able to, um, to fundamentally deal with these kinds of um, these shortcomings. So um, yes, this is, this is a big security issue on a number of domains. 
Um, like the self-driving car example is one of them because if you cover up a sticker in just the right way, you can trick the system to thinking that it's a stop sign or, or instead of it being a stop sign, you think it's a whatever, a, a sign to, to keep going and so a green light. So, um, but this is, this is very serious. Um, yeah. So I've been actually working on adversarial examples in this domain. Um, <clears throat> and it is, I think, a problem there. It's something that you wouldn't necessarily, like someone isn't necessarily going to attack these systems, but it does show you that they are very fragile. And what I'm finding is that they, there are a lot of concerns. As someone coming from a math background, I think of a neural network as it's just a function. It's some sort of a mapping from your data space to some sort of target space that you're interested in. And these mappings with neural networks are very complicated. All these different layers, learning the features, these are very complicated mappings. And these are in high dimensional space. You're training with a lot of data, but you're in very high dimensional space. You have a huge number of parameters. And so these functions in a lot of ways, they do well. You can regularize them so they give you nice results. But there are ways in which, because you have a really complex function in a high dimensional space, they're not always well behaved. And so these exa adversarial examples, why I'm interested in it is to me, this raises concerns. Um, this is something that's been known in the community for a long time, um, that these methods are so sensitive. And um, Zach was mentioning that there, there are methods to, to try to work against this. Um, but it's still something that it's very difficult to show or to, to train a network that doesn't have this property that you can perturb it or change it just a little bit um, and have it change the result pretty dramatically. Um, and a lot of the methods do that. There are some people who are trying to make methods that won't necessarily hurt performance, but in some cases it does. Um, and a lot of these methods are also only able to show that for very restricted cases of the kinds of perturbations, like adding Gaussian noise, or for instance, like you may be able to show that you can't add Gaussian noise that will change um, the class. And so it is sort of an ongoing problem, and it, I think, but it is something that people like me are starting to think about and work on. Um, but it is somewhat a fundamental aspect of um, deep neural networks. Some of the less complicated methods you can also attack, but it's more difficult. So one of the things, kind of going back to um, to Richard's question about, you know, whether or not, you know, what's the advantage of this over STALTA? I think one of the advantages of methods like STALTA and traditional methods is that we do know, um, you know, we have estimates, we have ideas of when they're going to fail. We have for a lot of numerical techniques, we know. Um, you know, how accurate they are. And I think this is still a disadvantage of machine learning methods that I think both this community needs to be aware of, but also it's something that's an active area of research. Um, and I think that that's something that um, I think geoscientists need to be more aware of and think about as we're applying these methods. All right, I think this is probably a great time to end and mull this a little bit more over lunch. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Jing Kai for his great presentation and all this morning's speakers. So I hope they're going to uh, hang around and we're going to break for lunch for one hour and then we're going to reconvene at um, uh, 1.45. Thanks, everybody.